Good afternoon. Bienvenidos todos. I'd like to welcome all graduate students, graduating students, their families, distinguished guests, friends, faculty, and staff to our departmental graduation ceremony. My name is Miguel Garcia Garibay, and as the chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, it is my pleasure to preside over this ceremony. It is an absolutely gorgeous day to celebrate the accomplishments of the chemistry and biochemistry graduating class of 2016. I don't remember the weather being this good in a graduation ceremony <laughs> as ever. We were always toasting under the sun, very nice for a little while, and it was difficult. But today is just beautiful. I think the weather is trying to tell us something special about the 2016 class. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guests who are present with us today. They are alumnus Richard Buller, who we'll be, we'll be hearing a lot more about in a few minutes. Uh, he is joined by his wife, Kathy Buller, son Matthew Buller, and his wife, Cynthia Brooke Gilly, son Andrew Buller, Belinda Venka, and his son, Ryan Buller, and lastly, his son also, Ian Buller. Uh, we also have uh, with us Robin Ganschel, whose uh, family are longtime supporters of the department. <clears throat> Joseph Rodnick, the Dean of Physical Sciences and Senior Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences is also here with us today. The official conferring of degrees in, in the graduate division and college took place on Thursday and Friday. And this afternoon is our special opportunity to bring together those of us in the UCLA community who are associated with the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and to acknowledge and recognize the accomplishments of our graduating bachelors of science, masters of science, and doctor of philosophy candidates. As a chair of the department, I congratulate you on joining a distinguished family of alumni. We hope that you will continue to consider UCLA and our department your home away from home. We will be proud to count you as a chemistry and biochemistry UCLA Bruin for a life. I also congratulate your families the parents, grandparents, spouses, partners, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons, and other family members who have, who have stood by you and supported you through the heights and loss of your studies. Let us give them a big round of applause. <laughs> the program for our graduating ceremony is as follows. We'll begin with the presentation of the annual alumni award and the commencement address by Dr. Richard Buller. We will then confer graduate awards and then honor the PhD master's candidates. After that, we will award the undergraduate prizes and honors. And finally, we will recognize each of the bachelor's candidates. At this point, I would like to welcome Dean Joseph Rodnick to the stage to present the 2016 Chemistry and Biochemistry Alumni Award. Thank you, Miguel. Um, I'd actually like to uh, start with a personal note. Uh, this is going to be uh, my last weekend of commencement ceremonies as dean, my, my 10th and last weekend of commencement ceremonies as dean, because at the end of this month, uh, if my term finishes, I will be stepping down. I do so knowing that the leadership of the Division of Physical Sciences will pass into very good hands. In fact, spectacularly good hands. Because chemistry and biochemistry chair Miguel Garcia Garabay, from whom you have just heard, will be taking up the reins on July 1. And 
so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Miguel on my behalf and on behalf of the entire Division of Physical Sciences. Now I'm pleased to have the honor to present the 2016 Chemistry and Biochemistry Alumni Award. The department initiated this award in 2012 to recognize the tremendous contributions their alumni have made to science and to society. With so many distinguished alumni of UCLA Chemistry and Biochemistry, any number of individuals are deserving of this award, which makes the selection process both pleasant and challenging. And once again, the award will go to someone with a truly exceptional record of accomplishments. So after a few words of introduction, it will be my great honor to present the 2016 Chemistry and Biochemistry Alumni Award to Dr. Richard Bullard. Dr. Buller received his Bachelor of Science in, and degree from Chemistry from UCLA in 1971 and was awarded both Doctor of Medicine and Doctor of Philosophy degrees, that is, both his MD and his PhD, from Baylor College of Medicine in 1976 and 1977. He has pursued a career in the practice of obstetrics and gynecology, followed by a fellowship in gynecologic oncology at UC Irvine and then in academia as professor and head of gynecologic oncology and professor of pharmacology at the University of Iowa. There, his research focus was on the molecular biology of ovarian cancer, and in addition, he conducted clinical trials. As a clinician and scientist with board certification in gynecologic oncology, Dr. Buller has authored approximately 150 basic science and clinical publication while mentoring a large number of fellows. He has also received numerous awards and honors, including multiple year listings in the Guide to American Top Physicians prepared by the Consumer Research Council of America. In 2004, Dr. Buller joined the pharmaceutical industry to work in clinical development at GlaxoSmithKline and then to the translational medicine at Exelixis before moving to Pfizer as head of translational oncology. Since 2012, he has overseen oncology clinical development, clinical statistics, and clinical pharmacology. Dr. Buller is the vice president of translational oncology and interim head of oncology late stage clinical development in the Pfizer Oncology Business Unit. His group is responsible for the development of biomarker and companion diagnostic clinical strategies as well as proof of mechanism and pharmacology for drug candidates. Dr. Buller's efforts have resulted in two companion diagnostics and more than 10 new or supplemental drug applications, including Zalcori for non-small cell lung cancer and Ibrantz for breast cancer. Dr. Buller married his high school sweetheart, Kathy, and they are the proud parents of four sons and a daughter. And as Miguel did, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Buller family members in the audience. His wife, Kathy Buller, and his sons Matthew, Ryan, sorry, Matthew, Andrew, Ryan, and Ian, and daughters-in-law Cynthia and Belinda. We are grateful that you are here today to join us. And now, with great pleasure, I invite Dr. Rupp Buller to join me to accept the award and present his commencement address titled, Is It Really Serendipity? Very impressive. The award. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Rudnick, Chair Garcia Garbe, and faculty of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I'm honored to be here as your 2016 Alumnus of the Year. I also want to thank my family for their career enabling support over the years. The only one who's missing is my daughter, Becca, who's in Maryland 
who's in Maryland uh, and couldn't travel because of work. So, members and guests of the class of 2016, it's a privilege to be able to address you today. This is an academic event, so let's start with some questions. Sir Alexander Fleming, Paul Ehrlich, and Apollo 13, what do these two men in a space mission have in common? Why should we think about them on this year college graduation day? You might answer it's serendipity, a word which according to Webster is luck that takes the form of finding valuable or pleasant things that are not looked for. But before accepting this luck hypothesis, let's take a closer look at the events associated with Fleming, Ehrlich, and Apollo 13. Then I'd like to share a few career-shaping moments from my life ever since I sat on the other side of this podium 45 years ago. In so doing, I would ask you to ponder the question, is it really serendipity? Sir Alexander Fleming was investigating the properties of staphylococcal bacteria in 1927. Known for keeping a very untidy laboratory, he was getting ready to throw out stacks of culture plates that he'd left out on a bench during a summer vacation. Fortunately, he noticed a singular culture contaminated by a fungus had been cleared of bacteria. Benzyl penicillin resulted from that discovery. In 1909, Paul Ehrlich and his team, using techniques that today we would call high-throughput drug screening and medicinal chemistry, were searching for a treatment for sleeping sickness. They instead discovered a compound, arsphenamine, a relatively non-toxic arsenic-containing agent that turned out to be a cure for syphilis. In 1970, Apollo 13 was intended to produce a third U.S. lunar landing. But early in this mission, an oxygen tank exploded, seriously compromising the mission itself, as well as threatening the astronauts' very lives. One of the astronauts, Jack Swigert, was a last-minute replacement for Ken Mattingly, who'd been exposed to German measles. Before that explosion, Swigert probably was thinking, ah, serendipity. Afterwards, really bad luck. The failure of this mission to meet its objectives was more than offset by the phenomenal teamwork of the flight and ground crews to solve a diverse series of impossible flight and survival problems, allowing for the safe return of the crew. Today, many consider this failed lunar landing to be the most successful space mission ever. In each of these examples, we see individuals demonstrating keen observational skills, change agility, and rapid problem solving, even when faced with data not the focus of their intended actions or investigations. But there is also a hidden message. In each case, Outcomes were enabled by collaboration, supported by a diversity of educational skills. Ehrlich was a physician scientist who contributed to the fields of antimicrobial therapy, hematology, and immunology. Fleming was a pharmacologist, biologist, and a botanist. And those astronauts were not just jet fighter pilots. They were also skilled in mathematics, astronomy, aerospace, and mechanical engineering. Now let's turn to an event that we, the class, you, the class of 2016, and I have in common, a first UCLA chemistry exam. <laughs> in my case, it was an honors midterm. As I opened that test, I heard this huge amount of clanking noises all around me and realized in horror that those were the sounds of metallic slide rules being put on desktops. In those days, you see, there were no handheld calculators. We used slide rules to quickly solve complex problems requiring square roots, logarithms, or exponential calculations. And I had left mine in the dorm. <laughs> this was a terrifying Apollo 13 moment for me. All I could think of initially was failing the exam. Fortunately, my UCLA career had started as a math major in upper division math classes. And I knew I had the tools in my head to try to tackle the exam using manual calculations. If I could only calm down. 
By earning a B grade the hard way, I survived, just as the astronauts survived coming home the hard way. However, that exam was about much more than balancing equations, molarity, and pH. It was about focus, doing something complex one step at a time, and adaptability under duress. Growing up in San Diego, one of my hobbies was playing golf on a course mostly used by right retirees. As a fairly shy bogey golfer, I usually played alone. I wasn't good enough to play with the par shooters, uh, but good enough that playing with the duffers could be quite painful. Playing daily over the second quarter break of sophomore year, I frequently ran into an older couple who were real duffers. They didn't count all their strokes, they kicked the ball to improve their position, but they didn't throw their clubs or swear a lot, so I often joined them to play. One afternoon during a casual conversation, I was dumbfounded to learn that Kurt Schuler was a physical chemist and chair of the Department of Chemistry at UCSD. Thus, mediocre golf skills generated my first professional job. There, I put my mathematical acumen to work for three summers at UCSD doing x-ray crystallography and solving a random rock walk problem that's relevant to semiconductors. Serendipity? I think not. Rather, an opportunity that came from networking outside of academics, willingness to engage others, that I might have otherwise avoided, and broader career skills beyond those required for my now new organic chemistry focused major. A deep interest in steroid hormone biochemistry and endocrinology took me to Vanderbilt in 1971 for a combined degree. The attraction, world renowned adrenal endocrinologist Grant Little. Failing in multiple attempts to meet with Grant over three months, I decided to try another door. Bertam Alley was a pioneer in the new field of steroid hormone receptors. On my first attempt to make an appointment, his secretary said he was in town, called him, and minutes later I was in a deep discussion. I might add that was a rarity. Famous people are often out of town in academics, and I was pretty lucky that day. As we finished our discussion, Bert gifted me a copy of an endocrinology textbook, assigned four chapters, and told me to come back when I was done. Soon thereafter, I was researching the progesterone receptor. A year later, Bert was chair of cell biology at Baylor, and he suggested I take a leave of absence and do a research fellowship at Baylor. As a result, both of my degrees now come from Baylor. And oh, by the way, Bert is now known as the father of molecular endocrinology. Like Apollo 13, my mission to work with Little had failed, but I learned the importance of availability of finding a true mentor and the rewards of flexibility in managing goals, just as Ehrlich and Fleming had done. In the fall of 1989, during the last year of my GYN Oncology Fellowship, I received a recruitment letter from the University of Iowa searching for a faculty member who could build a research program to support a new fellowship. This would be a tenure track position with protected research time and a significant amount of startup support. I can still remember as she was doing dishes. As I finished, Kathy This sounds wonderful. It's everything you were looking for. Where is it? Iowa City, Iowa, I said. Instantly. Iowa. I'm not moving to Iowa. <laughs> Discouraged, I put the letter back on my desk, only to rediscover it about six weeks later. I reread it, and darn, the job description seemed like I'd written it for myself. So we decided together I should write back to Iowa, send a CV, and if offered, go for an interview. We agreed that this practice interview could be very helpful for the broader recruiting process. Of course, I was reminded again, we're not going to be moving to Iowa. The interview revealed warm, friendly, smart people, a family-oriented environment, and most importantly, a great job opportunity. A second visit was proposed, which would give Kathy a chance to see the community. She reluctantly agreed. Now this trip was nothing less than supernatural. 
Northwest Airlines lost our ticket reservations, claiming I'd canceled them. Fortunately, a soft-hearted supervisor agreed to let us go at the same price we'd paid four weeks earlier. The movie on the plane was Field of Dreams, set in the cornfields of Iowa, you know, with Kevin Costner and James Earl Jones. We arrived in Iowa City in time for the start of Game 3 of the World Series between the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants. For those who don't remember, this was the game that was postponed due to an earthquake. Among other damages, a large section of the upper deck of the San Francisco Bay Bridge dropped onto the lower deck, killing a number of people and shutting the bridge to traffic in both directions. Kathy used to drive that bridge regularly. This sequence of events caused Kathy to soften her position just a bit by remarking it appeared that a higher power seemed to want us to move to Iowa. <laughs> you might guess the rest. Together, my family and I spent 13 amazing years in Iowa. Serendipity, perhaps, but also a demonstration of the positive outcomes that can come from good communication, flexibility, and perseverance, even in the face of resistance or apparent failure. When you, the class of 2016, are well-established in your careers, you will be peppered by emails, phone calls, and other uh, contacts from recruiters and those wanting or pitching something. You cannot answer all of these, but I would advise you not to ignore them either. In 2002, after building a nationally recognized division at Iowa, I was trying to figure out my next career move. One day, I answered the phone, only to find a recruiter on the line, shucks. That led to an interview, though, at Johnson & Johnson, followed by a job offer three days after the interview. It probably didn't hurt to have the VP of Clinical Development already know me. You see, I had worked with her as a principal investigator on an ovarian cancer P53 gene replacement therapy trial in the 1990s when she was at Shearing Plow. I was intrigued, but the jump to industry or the dark side, as you probably know it, was anxiety provoking, especially with so little information. In response to these worries, the recruiter produced three quick additional interviews with Amgen, GSK, and Roche. Now with three job offers in hand to compare, I wound up choosing GSK because of culture. You can't underplay the value of culture in your careers, wherever you work. Serendipity, I think not. Rather, it was availability change agility, and networking, together with a diverse background as a clinician and scientist that launched my current career. Okay, enough of the stories. What advice can I share with you to take home along with your diplomas today? First, have a plan. Where do you want to be in five years, 10 years, and later? Second, avoid intellectual tunnel vision and don't be afraid to change career directions. Third, and related to number two, leave as many doors open as you can. Educate yourselves broadly so you can at least communicate with others across multiple fields of endeavor. This is hugely important in science and medicine in order to collaborate and build networks. Fourth, develop a passion for what you do. It's easier to be successful if work is fun. Fifth, don't be afraid of the unknown. Failure and change are growth opportunities. Six, answer some of those cold calls and unsolicited emails or letters. You can never tell when one might change your life. As for the question of the day, is it really serendipity? My answer is a resounding no. Rather than luck, it's recognizing when you have an opportunity in front of you. Because opportunities are everywhere if you only look for them. And with that, thank you very much. And to the class of 2016, I say congratulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Buller, for this uh, really inspiring address. I think we will always remember that serendipity is nothing but an opportunity when it's framed in the right way.